And they said, well, it's a pretty nice trout, guys. And I made them pry it out of me. And finally, they, they forced me to guess. And I said, well, I could eight, eight and a half, maybe nine. And they went, wow, man. But I know if I just walked down there and said, I just caught a nine pound trout, they just said, bullshit. Hello and welcome to the Ireland on the Fly podcast about the people and places of fly fishing in Ireland. It's a very special guest we have on this week's episode. And truth be told, when it first started, I don't think I ever would have imagined speaking to him for Ireland on the Fly. He was the inspiration when I first started out on fly fishing over 15 years ago. And since then, with every new release, I have kept up with his musings, essays and reflections on a life lived through fly fishing. And so this week for our latest Ireland on the Fly book club episode, it's an honor to be speaking to John Geerich, the prolific and best-selling fly fishing writer whose first collection, Trout Bum, in 1986, opened the door to so much. And Tom, I know you're as much a fan as I am. Good man, Dara. Yeah, I really have to say, very much a fan. I mean, kind of a almost a bit starstruck <laughs> having <laughs> John. Yeah, I was having John on uh, and talking to him because um, I, like you, uh, took a hell of a lot. Uh, when I first started reading his books um, a long time ago, and uh, yeah, it was it, it was just fantastic. But it was it was it was great to hear him just talk, you know. Yeah, and yeah. Was, and it, you know? Uh, warning, um, and I did. I warned you as <laughs> I wanted to ask him about writing at the start because you know I was fascinated just the writing, you know, the the nitty gritty of it, and he got into that. But we do get onto fishing as well. We do get onto fishing, but I mean, like listening to John Gear, uh, listening to John talking about writing is, is fascinating as well. Um, you know, it's it's good to hear these things, but we, as, as you say, we do get onto fishing, do get onto <laughs> fishing, and a couple of things about the bamboo rods that I wasn't aware of. And uh, yeah, no, uh, the one thing I've, I, and I only remember it afterwards, I was saying it to you about, you know, that I've quoted it so many times. I mean, my favorite one of John Girak, I didn't get a chance to say the quote to John. I only thought of it afterwards. Um, and he says, when talking about fly fishing, Never quote facts. Always give opinions. Facts can often be wrong. The worst thing an opinion can be is weird. <laughs> and I just, oh yeah. And actually, that's actually applicable ap- applicable to things other than fishing. Yes. You know, so it's about weird. fishing and so much more. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's the thing. Like for me, uh, when I, like I said, when I first started um, fly fishing 15 years ago, and I was, you know, just naturally again kind of drawn to the books. And I remember Peter O'Reilly's book was probably the first one I picked up. Um, and I don't know how I came across Trout Bum. And, but I think what the appeal was, and I think this is part of his wider appeal to anglers, is that he basically took himself off to Colorado and said, I just want to fish. I want to see what happens i'm gonna roll the dice but i just want to fish and i'm gonna live whatever way i can and he's made a success out of it and yeah. every angler is a small part of him or a big part of him goes i wish that was me yeah i think that you've just hit the nail on the head firmly yeah you know, that that's 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 you know you look at from me and everybody else you just look at it and you go yeah he's done it yeah. you know he, he he's just done it exactly yeah He's eat a dream and he's fulfilled that dream. Yeah, yeah, exactly. For me, it's the writing side <laughs> and then the anger. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Is it the writing side? I'd never but, guessed. <laughs> <laughs> I always ask myself, if you won the lottery, what would you do tomorrow? Mm. And I always think, well, I'd write in the morning and then I'd go fishing afterwards. No. no. There you go. What would you do, Tom, actually, if you won the lotto? If I won the lotto, I. What would you do uh, tomorrow? How would you spend your typical day? Yeah, if I won the lotto, I'd probably go fishing. Yep, I'd probably mm. go fishing. And you I wouldn't have to bring clients with you. Well, you wouldn't have to. I mean, like anything else, guidance is a job, right? So, you know, the reason to do a job is to, to support myself. So I wouldn't have to do it to support myself. But I'd still, I said, well, would you guide? I'd still make sure I'd be fishing with lots of different people. Interesting people. And I, Yeah. Well, and, uh, everybody's interesting. True, true. There are very few people who aren't interesting. But, um, and that and that's one of the reasons probably why I actually really enjoy guiding is because you get to meet a lot of different sorts of people. And um, as I said, everybody's interesting. No, I know what you tie flies in the evening. No, no, do you know what I do? I wouldn't. I wouldn't tie flies in the evening. I'd I'd I get them all tied for me. From 
winning the lotto to one man who metaphorically won the lotto, uh, John Garrick, like who, as I said, is living the life that so yeah. much of us um, wish we could. Um, but we'll go back to work tomorrow. Uh, but let's hear from one thing. One thing just before he, what he, said, he does work very hard. Oh, but he loves it. That's yeah, it. but yeah, but he does, you know. But it's not work then. When, yeah, oh my God, God, we're going to go off on another tangent here. No, right, no, sorry, no, let's get into sorry, the interview. I, get into into <laughs> I tell you what, look, let's just hear from John Gear. <laughs> and yeah, people do okay, not want yeah. to hear from us anymore. Um, and I first asked John whether he saw himself as a fly angler or a writer first. Oh, I think writer first. A lot of a lot of fishermen are are um, are disappointed by that, but that's how I I you know I get to see it however I want to see it. When did writing become something that you thought? Because tell us a bit about your background. You no offense, you you probably didn't come from a background that kind of where writing was something that you aspired to, was it? You know, I remember in in uh, high school I started getting interested in writing in high school. Maybe my junior year i had i had one of those life-changing teachers a guy named alan smith who just lit up literature for me um that's a i keep wanting to write an essay about that uh, and it's at least an essay essay length story but um and then i read hemingway's uh, a movable feast in which it was about his years in paris and he made being a writer look like endless rounds of skiing and fishing and drinking with smart people and occasionally dashing off Nobel Prize winning stories. And it looked like uh, it looked like a, a great life for a guy who didn't care to work that much. And by the time years later, by the time I realized it was a, a lot of work, uh, I enjoyed the work. So. It was okay, but that's probably where it came from. I'm interested though because you you studied philosophy um, at university, but I, I read an interview mm-hmm. you did where you said you didn't like the way they taught English lit. You you you'd studied English lit for a while or something, or you took a module in it and you just you said mm-hmm. no. Nah. Tell me a bit about that. Like, what what was it that turned you off? It like, well, they kept trying to teach it as if it were a a, a secret code that we were trying to break. And every time someone would say, well, what does the author mean? I'd think, well, why can't he mean just what he said? Why, why does there have to be some hidden message, uh, some, some ulterior motive? It wasn't taught as if it was intended to be fun. And I always thought writing literature was fun. I mean, that was my that was my experience with it. That's why I liked it. I thought this is fun. It's fun to play with language and see what other people do with language. Um, and, and all the really all the little artistic tricks you can play with language that people may not be entirely aware of when they're reading you. Um, even just to, even just to writing in something resembling iambic pentameter. So it, sounds right if you read it out loud it sounds right um so i just and and in philosophy all we did was read dense complicated books and then write papers simplifying and clarifying them and comparing them and it, that taught me more about writing than anything in english the english department had but it was, you know, it was the 1960s. I, j- I, had, I had some kind of vague intellectual aspirations, but I had no idea what I wanted to do. I think it's interesting as well, though, um, John, because you were saying you started, you wanted to be a poet, you wanted to be a short story writer. You kind of, you know, wanted yourself to be taken seriously as a writer. Kind of realized it wasn't working out. And then you kind of nearly fell into writing about fly fishing that you kind of were like, well, I'm doing fly fishing all the time. I might as well write about it now and see where that takes me, kind of, was it? I basically started doing it for the money. Because, um, at the, well, I was, I was a poet and, and aspiring novelist, short story writer, whatever. And, you know, you, you 
you don't make a living at that. But people were back then, back in the 60s and early 70s, everything was in print. There were no websites. There were no computers. Nobody had a computer. And so if it was in print, everyone understood it had to be paid for. So you could make a couple of hundred bucks for a story. And uh, that's how I got into it. And then I started discovering people like Tom McGuane, Jim Harrison, Chatham, handful of others, um, not to mention the, uh, the new journalists, um, Hunter Thompson, Tom Wolfe, and just realize this stuff can be done uh, as literature. And it didn't have to be two separate things. I didn't have to be a fishing writer to finance my serious literary career. I did. They could, they could go together. I just remember thinking, yeah, that's, that's a possibility and kind of going off in that direction. And it started to work. And, uh, um, I realized you didn't, you could write stories as, as Nick Lyon said, the best fishing stories aren't really about fishing. So you could, you could actually write fishing stories that could see over the top of the, of the material into the human condition in some way. And people would, even if they didn't exactly understand what you were doing, they'd appreciate it. And the editors often saw it and, and appreciated it. So it was just, like I said, it kind of dawned slowly. It's funny you should say that, John, because I've always seen you, and I've read a lot of your stuff, I've always seen you as a storyteller. You're a storyteller and you you put fishing into your stories, but primarily you're a storyteller or a writer. But, you know, when, when I'm reading your work, I, I'm, I'm listening to your story. And it just so happens to be about fishing, which really... It, grabs me from the, the word go, which I think is great, but I think that's fair. So I wanted to ask you, John, we're going back here. So you left college, you aspire to be a poet and a writer. Now you moved to Colorado. Were you writing then? Was there, was there any future for you in writing then that you saw, or was it just that you wanted to go out there just to live in Colorado and fish? Uh, I didn't, I, I don't think I put the, I was writing at the time. I don't think I ever thought there was more for me in terms of writing in Colorado. I just always wanted to come out West. Yeah. Um, I grew up watching Western movies, John Wayne, uh, Jimmy Stewart. And, you know, that was just a, a, a big part. It was, it was romantic. And, um, and, you know, in the sixties, it was, it was, it wasn't exactly the wild west out here, but it was a it was pretty open. Uh, uh, there were fewer people, and you could kind of get away with things a little easier. I mean, you didn't have to toe the line quite as much when there weren't as many witnesses around. So, um, it, you know, it was a it was a pretty free and easy place. And so, what did you do to survive? Oh, I just worked whatever jobs I could work. Um, Best job I had was we we cut um, we cut trees we cut trees for the Forest Service. Uh, there was a huge uh, pine bark beetle infestation here, and the Forest Service would pay these crews to cut the trees, limb them out, stack the logs, and then they'd come out and, and and spray the logs and cover them with plastic. And after a certain amount of time the wood was just yours to do with as you please. So we'd sell the biggest logs to a um, uh, 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 sawmill for lumber. And then we would um, buck the rest up into firewood and sell that. And it was great work. It was, I was as, I was as ripped as I've ever been <laughs> those, those few years. And you got to fish then on the off time. Was that the deal? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I would I would often fish on my way home. Did the real success kind of come with the publication of Trout Boom? The 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 first inklings that this might actually go somewhere came with Trout Boom. It was um, people didn't know what to make of it at first. It was sort of a counterculture take on a on a really straight laced sport that that up until then had been pretty pretty English uh, influenced 
everybody wanted hardy reels and English rods and talked about all the uh, chalk stream fishermen. Uh, and, but I, I it, and it, it really didn't sell that well right out of the gate, but it stayed in print and the sales went up and up and up. And until the publisher came and said, do you have another book? Which is always a good sign. Okay, let's have another book. And so I, of course I said, yes, I didn't, but I said yes and came up with one. And so, yeah, it, and it, it also probably got me to, um, well, it did get me to uh, a bigger publisher. Simon & Schuster bought the paperback rights to a couple of my books. And then when I was off contract with that publisher, it didn't take a rocket scientist to just go right to Simon and Schuster say, do you want the next one? And they had, the books had done just well enough that they did want the next one and so on. So yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, it made a big difference, but it, it, it made a big difference, but I didn't see it coming right away. Um, it was interesting, actually, just ahead of the interview, I was, I was looking back over my copy of um, Trout Bum. Um, Me too. And, and I was reading Sorry. <laughs> Gary, Gary LaFontaine's um, introduction. Very, very prescient. Um, he said, and this was in 1986, he was writing it like, you know, so that was the, when it was, um, what are we now? She's nearly 40 years. Um, John is such a splendid example of a Trout Bum and everything unique and free about such anglers that it's a shame he can't stay that way forever. He's too good a writer to escape success. Worse still, he's so conscientious turning in polished pieces on time that magazine and book editors won't stop heaping assignments on him. Like, he was he was pretty much flagging it that he says that he'll stay at Trout Bum as long as he appreciates the freedom he has to live his angling life on a day-to-day -day basis. Has your life changed because of success? In the sense of, you know, you started out with that trout bum ethos. Were you able to maintain that trout bum ethos still to this day because of your success? I think that's something the reader has to decide. Um, I, th I think yes. I think I have. I, you know, I never got into the business. So many people got into having a line of mm. fly rods or, you know, whatever it is, a, a, a guide service. And I just never did that. And so I think that kind of left me on the outside a little bit. And no doubt, um, John, you probably had plenty of opportunities to go down that road. Would I be right? Yeah. Uh, were you approached with things like that? Yeah. In a, yeah. A little bit early on. Not as much as you might think. Um, they, I, I think the companies wanted... They wanted people like Lefty Cray and Gary LaFontaine who were technicians and could tell people how to catch fish, uh, buy these flies and you'll catch fish, you know, um, buy this rod and you'll catch more fish. And, and I wasn't doing that. So I had a few offers to endorse things, but um, never really did. Um, I, I occasionally I, I I did endorse a couple of bamboo rods a friend of mine was making, but that was just because it was a friend of mine. And because what I got in return was free rods. Perfect. Happy days. Happy Perfect. Days. I'm with you totally on that one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> John, what do you put your um continual success down to? I, I work real hard at what I do and um I'm conscientious. I I I don't send out anything that's half baked. Um, I don't send out anything that's that I don't think is good. And I'm constantly trying to improve. The same thing that keeps any craftsman uh, up on his craft. I mean, I just try to do a good job. And um, it's probably as simple as that. How do you work? Do, do you have a set routine for when you're writing? Do you set aside a day and go, Tuesday doesn't look like a good fishing day. Uh, I'm going to sit down for eight hours and write. Is it, is, is it no. as, like, it's not like that, no? No, not really. It, 
it depends on what I'm doing. If I'm working on a book, which I always try to do over the winter when there isn't much fishing, um, then it's a routine. I, I get up in the morning, get coffee, get breakfast, come down to the office, turn on the computer, and I'm at work for four or five hours. Usually I'll walk or something later in the day. Um, the rest of the time, I work when um, either I have the time. I've always got something going. So anytime I have the time to work, I can do it. I have something to work on. And um, or I'll work when there's something to do. If somebody wants a, a story by a certain time, I'll I'll have to work on that. Um, Right now, I'm trying to get some stuff done between uh, book promotion and I've got a, a fishing trip coming up uh, early next month. So this month, I'm, I've got a lot of book promotion and I'm working on a couple of stories. And uh, I just, you know, I try to slip my actual life in there somewhere. And that's that's how I do it. One thing I want to ask you on, this, on the thing, because you come up with so many in your stories, so many really little interesting things of, of things that happened to you, let's say on a fishing trip or whatever. Do you take notes? Do you ever jot down something and go, God, I'm going to put that in the story or do you just keep it in your head? No, I take notes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I used to take more extensive notes than I do now. Um, but I do take a lot of notes. I've got notebooks all over the place. Um, I'd say they're and good I reading. Have, I don't know. I don't know if they make much <laughs> sense. I mean, I have one in my pocket, a little one in my pocket right now. Cool. If um, anything that strikes me, I write it down. But I found it's most useful to write down, like, who was, what was the name of the guide on Thursday as opposed to on two, Wednesday? Um, what's the name of the river? What kind of drift boat was it? If there, if it was an interesting boat, say it was a wooden boat, was it a raised river dory or, you know, uh, local spellings, Chiganagak volcano, right? I mean, where are you going to look up Athabascan words except on site on the, the map that the guide has? Um, so those are the, and that's just experience. Those are the questions I always want answered. And I would come back, E.B. White, you know, E.B. White used to write for the New Yorker magazine. Ah, wonderful old writer, long dead. Um, he said once in an essay that he had, he had gone on a, he'd signed on to a freighter that was sailing from like Seattle to, to Anchorage and stopping at all these little ports along the way. And he was 16, I think, at the time. And years later, he wanted to write about it, and he dug up the his, his notebook from that trip. And he said it was full of cosmic the cosmic observations of a 16-year-old kid, and he wanted to know the name of the captain the name of the <laughs> ship the name of the port where he saw the pretty girl in the bar and all the details and he didn't have any of that it was all philosophy and it was useless and he couldn't write the story and and so that's that's what i do is i write down all those details so if if only to save myself from calling the outfitter back and saying, who was that guy we fished with on Thursday? What was the name of that creek? You know. But it, it's in the details, John, isn't it? It's those little nuggets, I think, that just kind of give it that layer, like, you know. That's what puts you in the story. Hmm. It's, not the, it's not the broad strokes. It's the little details. Yeah. And, and they also, I write in a, in a pretty um, stream of consciousness style and sometimes it's those little details that'll that'll set you off on a, on a little different direction john just uh, you mentioned hard work and being conscious conscientious how many drafts would you do on an essay uh, i'm thinking say for a book 
um, for the publisher. How many times would you would you work on it? Would you do drafts on it? You know, I've I've, I've wondered about that. I don't. I could probably make a guess if I knew what constituted a draft. Um, if I go, I go over the stuff endlessly and I go over it and I get it where I think, okay, it's almost right, but there's this section that doesn't quite fit. And I don't know if it just needs to come out or if I need a better transition into it. Um, there's places where the language is a little awkward. So put it away, work on something else for a couple of weeks or go fishing or whatever it is and come back and I'll go over it again and I'll fix, maybe I'll take that one paragraph out and change a few other things and put it away and come back again and go, no, without that paragraph, this doesn't make sense. So the paragraph comes back. Um, Always changing words. A trick I learned from uh, John McPhee, who's a wonderful, uh, a wonderful writer who's written brilliantly about writing, a couple of books about, about writing, um, is to just re-examine the details. Just go back to the smallest little details. And, and if a word, if you use a word that seems almost right, almost good enough, but not entirely, rather than use as a thesaurus, hard word to say, um, go to a dictionary, look up the meaning of the word. And a lot of times you'll find, we make these assumptions about words, we think we know what they mean because we've seen them a thousand times, but we actually don't sometimes. And you go, yeah, this is, is almost right, but it's about five degrees to the left of what I want. And you look up synonyms and you look up words used that were used in the definition of the word in question and ferret out the right word. Um, and you'll know it when you find it, at least I do. When I, when I find the right word, it just, it just leaps off the page. Yeah. But sometimes it takes a while. That's really good. I feel lazy now for using a thesaurus. Sorry. <laughs> well, Dictionary.com doesn't work. <laughs> well, this is, the thesaurus thithor, thithor, is, um, the, the, it sends you off in too many weird directions. I mean, you look up umbrella, you'll get bumber shoot, which you'll <laughs> never use, right? I mean, you just, you you tried it. You're better, better, yes. yeah, never you're better, never. better off in a better off in a dictionary, I think. Yeah, yeah. We must tell the kids what a dictionary is in case anybody. Yeah, <laughs> it's, 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 yeah it's, well, if we had words on a, a to Z. If if we had a uh, if we had video, I could hold one up. It's about a five pound <laughs> item, thin pages, lots of words, very boring, not much of a plot. <laughs> And that's the other thing why I wanted to ask you, John, is people kind of, I think, underestimate the really great writers like yourself, the amount of work and craft and drafting and redrafting and rewriting and, you know, and not being happy with what words are there, like you've just um, mm, explained to us. Yeah. I think I hope people get a sense of that. It's not a case of you go fishing, you have an idea for a story and you you lash it out onto the page over a couple of thousand words. You know, if it was like, if it was that easy, we'd all be doing it like, you know, and I think that's the one thing just to for people to really appreciate that the amount of work goes into the craft to, to actually become successful like that. Um, and I, I think it is very inspiring. Um, John, you might just talk to us a little bit about um, the current book. Um, because obviously COVID was a, it was an issue at the time. How did you, did you find yourself in terms of, you know, because you were limited in terms of what you could do, where you could go, that, did you find the writing a bit harder to do? Well, yeah, I did actually. Um, plus, plus the fact that, um, I'm trying to write a book and, you know, wondering if the world's going to end. Right. I mean, wondering if there'll be in, if if in another year and a half, there'll be anyone left alive to read the damn book. So there was that. But, yeah, I it 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 curtailed the travel pretty seriously, as it did almost everyone's. And. Um, 
so I had to, the, the, the early part of the book is pre-COVID. And then there's a, there's a very specific spot where all of a sudden there's COVID. And um, we were, we here in Colorado were told to uh, not go to work, not do this, not do that. Don't go any more than 10 miles from home. Not that anyone was enforcing that. Um, and so people went out and fished in the rivers because what else is there to do? Uh, you can't sit home and watch TV all day. Some did. But so the, the rivers were terribly crowded. <clears throat> and that was interesting because I, I was going to rivers that I'd fished for 30 years and finding new spots because everybody was standing in my old spots. So I learned to fish between the pools and in, in faster water. And uh, it was really pretty interesting. And I wrote about that. And um, I just, I just kind of wrote about it as it happened. Um, wearing masks. We uh, normally, my friends and I would pile into one pickup truck and drive to the river. But when we were supposed to be keeping a distance, we'd each drive our own truck up there. And so, and then the, the, um, the, the, the hidden benefit of that was we now we've got three trucks and we could park them all together and take up the entire turnout <laughs> on the side of the road and own like half a mile of river. Because people don't want to walk. So there was a lot of that, like, okay, what do you do when you can't get on an airplane and go to Alaska or Labrador or even Montana? Um, there was a time when you could drive to another state to fish, but they, some places wouldn't sell you an out-of-state fishing license because they didn't want out-of-staters coming. Uh, other places would uh, insist that you quarantine for 14 days. So you're going to be quarantined for 14 days so you can fish for a couple of days and then turn around and come home. Um, couldn't get an airplane, couldn't go to Canada. I, I canceled a couple of trips to, to Canada. But, you know, when you're a writer, it's all material. There was a, there was a week when I did nothing but make phone calls and emails canceling trips. But did you worry, John, in terms of maybe that you would kind of have less material that, you know, because your fishing orbit had been um, constricted now that like it's easier to write, I don't know, you know, when you're going to Alaska, Canada, you know, different places. Did, yeah. you, worry that, or did you worry about that? Yeah. Yeah, I did. And um but somehow it worked out, which is, I don't know, one thing you learn in life. I mean, you, you worry about things going right in the toilet. Usually they don't. Every once in a while they do. And then you figure that out. Um, you know, you're not done till you're dead. <laughs> so... I, I think I said somewhere in this new book that I was talking about being stuck at home. And I said, well, you know, Shakespeare wrote three of his greatest plays while he was hiding from the plague. And so I should be able to write a couple of fishing stories. <laughs> I think I heard, I think it was an, um, an interview I heard with you, uh, you did with Pete Tijas, um on the Fly Culture podcast, where he said, um, I think your last book is always the one that you're kind of happiest with or most proud of. Yeah, I think what I said was it's the one I think I should be most proud of because it's the most recent one. And you you don't want to think you're getting worse. You want to think you're getting better. Um, and also because it's it's just fresh. Um, you know, yeah. I just finished it. And um, yeah, it's just kind of it's kind of like a newborn, kind of like a puppy. You know, you just you have a soft spot for the puppy because it's just new and you don't know how it's going to do. And uh, I love the cover, by the way. I 
Yeah, Bob White uh, has been doing my my covers, and uh, I don't know. I think this is maybe the fourth or fifth cover he's done. But this is by far the best. Uh, I wish we could show it to people. It's absolutely gorgeous. We'll put up the image anyway um, alongside the, the podcast notes, John. And ah, we'll, put it on, great. we'll put it on social mm. media so people can see it. Actually, just tell us a bit, because um, one of the essays is titled uh, All the Time in the World, uh, which is the, the cover, um, the title. Tell us maybe just uh-huh. a bit about where that phrase, the context of that, where that came from. Well, um, not what people think. Um it was a, a friend of ours who, uh, a, a great guy and a good fisherman, uh, died, and uh, which I wrote about um, earlier. And um, I ended up with his ashes, and the his his kids, his his grown son and daughter, were going to come out here. They live in uh, one of them lives in uh, Wisconsin. One of them lives in. Uh, Hawaii, they were going to come out and go through his stuff, which was out in my garage. And then we were going to scatter the ashes someplace that Paul used to like to fish. And they just kind of, you know, if it was COVID and nobody's got a lot of money, they just never made it. So I've got my old fishing friend in, uh, in a, a, a plastic tub on the windowsill <laughs> for all this time. And in this one essay, I talked about deciding where he should go. And it had somehow fallen to me to decide where he should go. And I was having trouble. I mean, it seems like, I mean, in one sense, none of us are religious. So in one sense, it's just a box of ashes. It probably doesn't matter where it goes. But in another, it does matter where it goes because it's just this sort of shared poetry among his family and, and his friends. And I never did. I mean, he's still up there in the window. So, and at some point in the story, I just said, well, Paul, it's okay because Paul always acted like he had all the time in the world. And now he does. Very good. <laughs> the other world. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't. I think that's the kind of thing you're not really supposed to give away. But it's just one little thing in the book. No, it's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. John, have you, um, you've never been to Ireland. I haven't. I was in Scotland once, and I went through uh, England briefly to get to Scotland, but that was it. It was a it was a junket, and I just went where the where the group went. We fished the Bewley River for a week. There wasn't a salmon to be had. Yeah, I remember reading and, about uh, this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, they they there were no salmon in the river because they they were commercial fishing right off the mouth of the river. So they were trying to sell, uh, they were trying to sell timeshares on the river, and no one in in Scotland or Ireland or Britain would buy into it because they knew the story. So they thought, ah, we'll get Americans. So they brought five writers over to write about it. We figured it out in a day or two, and it just never worked. I, I imagine they went broke. I mean, it couldn't if they couldn't if you can't sell it to Americans, you can't sell it. <laughs> was it what? Is, what are the ones on, in the party with you went off with the chef or something? What was? <laughs> yeah. Oh, the um, yeah. One of the guys um, went off with the cook, uh, Jane. <laughs> Yeah. And um, it was uh, it was just for in, in terms of the story, it was just a little subplot. We all it took us all down to the down to the airport to fly home, and uh, he wasn't there, and <laughs> uh, we didn't know exactly what had happened. We knew we knew kind of what was happening, but not we didn't know the particulars. But you know, he um, they they got married. I mean, that was a real, a real romance. We just thought, it's again, being Americans, we thought, well, there's these little porn films going on here. <laughs> and, uh, but they got married and she moved to, to uh, Montana with him. He since died, but uh, that was a long time ago. But yeah, it was, uh, it was kind of a little fairy tale romance thing going on there. 
plenty of material anyway for the story. Well, um, plenty, but there didn't seem to be a lot of fish to write about. So, <laughs> no, exactly. there weren't a lot of fish. <laughs> no, there weren't. But there were some great characters and and uh, and yeah, and this whole romance going on in the background. Best fishing stories aren't about fishing. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But you'd ne- you'd never been tempted to come come to Ireland, um, especially from brown trout. Tom is a guide on Loch Corrib, which is uh, Tom. How do we say the finest brown trout lake in? I, I, okay, so here's a good one. I I guided an American guy once, and we got lovely. He got lovely trout, and the guy had been travelled all over the world. It was his first time in Ireland, and mm-hmm. holding the trout, I was put him back, and he goes. That's very special. And I said, brilliant, because it's lovely. And he said, no, no, he says, that is the first indigenous wild brown trout I've ever caught. And I've been in America, South America, and New Zealand. That's the first indigenous one. So, yeah, and I'd I'd actually never thought of that before. So I I have used it as promotional material from henceforth. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's all true. I mean, it's a good reason to do it. Um, Mm. It's like people coming out west here in the Rocky Mountains to catch cutthroats. Yeah. Or Mm. going to Labrador to catch brook trout. It's it's where they come from. It's where it's a spiritual home. It's where they're supposed supposed to be. be. Yeah. 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 What, John, what's your favorite species still to to fish for? Like, what's your... If you were to give, if you were given your last day on earth, what would, what would you fish for? My favorite species tends to be whatever's in front of me to be caught. You know what I mean? I mean, if, I mean, literally if I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by fishing with a fly rod. And if I'm fishing with, for, for carp, carp are my favorite that day. I try just as hard to catch a carp as I do to catch a big cutthroat or anything else. I always remember that story you wrote where the two guys on the dam, as you're covering the carp, point down and tell you, you know, those are carp. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. But I would have thought from your reading that you do you not have a hankering for brook trout? Mm. Oh, I do. uh, Sure. Um, But I also have a hankering for uh, native rainbows. I was up. Some years ago, I was up on the upper Columbia fishing for red band rainbows, which are native indigenous fish. And I do, I, I do have a I do have a soft spot for fish that are swimming in the water they evolved in. I, I do like that. So cutthroats in the west, up in the northeast, it's it's brook trout. Um, west coast is rainbows, and up in the mountains, it's uh, it's going to be cutthroats. But, I mean, if I had to choose, it would be some kind of trout. I have a real soft spot for trout. Uh, although, that said, if I lived out on the West Coast, uh, maybe if the returns were better than they are now, I would uh, uh, I might get into more deeply into steelhead because they're pretty compelling fish. Do you fish much for them at all, John, steelhead? Uh, yeah, have, but um, the returns, the returns, the returning runs have been pretty thin and pretty spotty these days. So it's really, you, you, if you live out there and have your ear to the ground and can kind of, uh, like my friend Scott Sadel, who's a fish writer who lives out there, you know, if somebody calls him and says, well, there's some fish in such and such of a river, can you be here in the morning? He can't. And but if you if you're coming from elsewhere and you're going to come out for a week, kind of a random week in season, um, you can't really count on anything. You can't count on seeing a fish. And it's one thing when the fishing is hard and it's another thing when it's impossible. And there's just no fish in the river. So I was listening to an interview. It was on the Millhouse podcast the Tom McGuane interview. I don't know, um, Tom, had you heard that one? Um, yeah, I, I am. It was, a, yeah, it was, it was a fascinating interview, but uh, they go into that whole Florida Keys scene down there and it sounded absolutely wild in the, the kind of 60s, uh, uh-huh. what was going on. Um, were you ever tempted to that fly, fly fishing culture or that fly fishing scene? I went down and fished saltwater a few times. I was tempted. And, um, you know, I found it interesting, but 
uh, was just so somehow so foreign. Um, everybody was a tough guy. Um, everybody had to drink a lot. Um, the guides all had this, this idea that if you were just a trout fisherman, you might as well not even be there. Might as well not even try. It was just real competitive. And then, I mean, the fishing's compelling enough, but um, I've never been a hot weather guy. So, you know, how much fun is it to stand out in 90 degree heat, pouring sweat, trying not to faint while you're, while you're waiting for a bonefish to swim by. I mean, it's just, I, I, I was so much happier on a trout stream that um, I just never, uh, I did it a few times, caught a few fish, went down to Baja, caught rooster fish, which is a lot of fun. Actually, actually more fun than, than the flats fishing. Um, and, uh, but you know, I just never, I just never got into it. Well, if you, if, if you like the cold and the wet, you should definitely come over to Ireland, John. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah seriously. I mean, it's you don't right like warm weather. We have a place for you. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you, John, um, 40 years, what, geez, 60 years since the 60s, 60 years of fly fishing in America. How has it changed? Has it changed for the better? Has it changed for the worse? It's obviously got a lot busier. There's a lot of issues around kind of rights and ownership and all that kind of stuff. How would you characterize the kind of change in fly fishing in America over the last few decades? It's it's gotten worse. Basically, there's just so many people in in most places, in many places. There's so many people that the fishers are just beat down. Um, the fish are... Uh, a lot of the a lot of the popular fisheries, the fish are much smarter than fish are. They've been trained to be, you know, kind of hyper alert, uh, very difficult to catch. Where you used to be able to just go out with a a couple of different fly patterns and fool a couple of fish. Uh, now, you know, you have to be an entomologist and have an encyclopedic encyclopedic fly boxes. And um, so there's and there's fewer fish in a lot of places because there's there's um there's hooking mortality even when there's catch and release a lot of people don't know how to handle fish well to release them alive and uh, environmental stuff i mean dewatering for for irrigation in places where they shouldn't be trying to grow crops in the first place colorado is high plains desert and they're growing winter wheat out here nobody should grow wheat out here it's insane um and, you know, Denver is getting to be a big city and everybody wants to wash their cars and water their lawns with water that comes out of the trout streams. Um, there's pollution from all kinds of things. Uh, we've had a, I don't know if you've heard, but we've had a lot of bad wildfires in the West. And um, that's resulted in mudslides and uh, um too much ash in the in the water and then because of climate change a lot of the woods that used to uh, grow along these trout streams aren't going to come back as woods they're going to come back as grassland and so you lose the shade over the water so the water gets warmer in the summer farther upstream which means it gets hotter downstream because it has more time to warm up under the daytime sun and so on. So, I mean, it's, um, it's not a happy story, really. Uh, there's still, there's still fishing. There's still plenty of fishing and it's uh, pretty good in places. You have to, um, you have to know where to go. And sometimes you have to sneak around and, uh, go farther or or somehow somehow eliminate the competition a little bit but there are ways to do that park three vans at the turning point yeah we're getting a jump we're getting this. <laughs> yeah yeah, John, yeah I'm, not gonna tell, I'm not going to tell you all the tricks because yeah. americans could be listening <laughs> uh, don't worry they won't they won't, John. They won't. Yeah. <laughs> we can we can take that bit out no no um don actually following there 
And it's funny because you mentioned the water extraction and it was just one of the things I wanted to ask you because I remember you writing before about uh, trying to protest and getting organized, trying to organize some sort of movement against water extraction. And I often mm-hmm. wondered, in America, how did things, environmental protests like that go? Like, have you had success? Have you had any success? Have local groups, be they anglers or just other concerned environmentalists, have they had success in stopping the water extraction? Or is it just an unstoppable force? Well, I think it's ultimately unstoppable in the sense that uh, we have to win every time and they only have to win once. But I mean, they'll, you know, they just come back in a couple of years and try it again and, and figure the local guys will be tired. And, and so, and, and they're right. You get tired, but hopefully there are younger guys coming along to pick it up. Um, There's been some, there have been some successes. They were going to not always having to do with water extraction, but we've gotten minimum flows and streams that, uh, that really needed them and it's helped. Um, but you know, it's, it begins to look like a losing battle because if you get minimum flow in a river where the water's going to be too warm for trout in another 40 or 50 years, where's the victory in that? I, you know, I, I mean, I think we're really looking at the need for bigger solutions than, um, a few extra cubic feet of of flow in a river or moving a few rocks around to make better habitat. I think we're looking at big global solutions now. Yeah. Uh, Speaking of which, John, um, I don't know, I'm a bit of a glass half empty. I think, you know, in the sense of, I think we're sleepwalking ourselves into extinction. Like, you know, in the meantime, in the meantime, people are like, oh, look what's on YouTube or look at my new iPhone. And you know what I mean? Um, but I, 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 I like to keep politics out of this, but I can't. I, I need to ask you what it's like. Trump's about to be appearing in court. You've got 2024 election coming up. You know, do you worry? Like I, you know, America is such a powerful force in the world, you know, let's just take from an environmental perspective in terms of leading the way, you know, in terms of what can be done. Do you worry about the the future of your country in the next few years in terms of where it's going and the divide and the, the black and white polarization of what we've seen of, of political issues and how that can then also filter down into environmental? Yeah. Yeah, I do. It, uh, it feels like living through the last years of Rome sometimes. Um, mm-hmm. it, it all depends on what happens next. I mean, we have we have laws, and um, if we enforce them, and we allow people to vote, um, I think we stand a pretty good chance. But you know, the the Republicans' big tactic is voter suppression. They they realize that rather than convince people that they're right, if they just keep people from voting, they can win. They keep everybody from voting except their own people. That's how they can win. So, you know, that's the big, that's one of the bigger challenges, just uh, keeping voting rights active. Um, you know, the last, last election, we had a huge turnout. People yeah. really, people really came out of the woodwork and said, okay, mm-hmm. we're, you know, we can finally see this and we need to come out and vote. And, um, you know, we held on to one house of Congress and they might have, uh, they might have had a huge uh, majority in the other house and now they have like five the majority of five so how does it feel in terms of compared to the 60s when you started riding you were fishing you moved to Colorado obviously that was a kind of a it was a time of upheaval with civil rights um Vietnam mm-hmm. War there was a lot going on in terms of societal change does it feel like that again or is it kind of much more intense it feels very similar and I, I sometimes I wonder if the difference between then and now isn't the difference in my age, because back then I was I was real hopeful. Um, I mean things things were scary, but I was I was really hopeful that we would 
we liberal types would come out on top. And for a long time, we did. Um, and now I'm not so hopeful, but now I'm an old man. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I don't have the fire in my belly that I had back then. So you should find a, a fisherman in his 30s and ask him what he well, can, can I Can I say something, John? Yeah. I think some of your writing can put the fire in the bellies of the 30-somethings. Well, that'd be nice. That'd be a nice thought. Yeah, I mean, you, it's it's there. It's there to save if people want to save it. It's still there. It isn't like we're not. You know, we're not talking about extinct species and and you know how it was way back when. I mean, it's still here. Are, are you glass half empty or glass half full when it comes to kind of I don't know the planet, the world, yeah. the human race? <laughs> I'm. I think I'm pessimistic. I'm the only glass half full guys here. I'm the only. Yeah. And you know why? It's because you're, you're a guide. I'm a guide. I'm a guide. That's why. <laughs> One more cast. Oh, One yeah. more cast. Yeah. Tell you, yeah. just around the corner. Yeah, they'll, they'll start biting any minute. <laughs> yeah. Now you're talking. Now you're talking. Yeah, but I mean that doesn't that doesn't mean I've given up. That just means in private moments, you know, when I go out to look at a sunset and think things over for a few minutes, I just think, man, it doesn't look good. But, but you know, it didn't look good in the '60s either. I mean, there was, in fact, there was more political violence in the '60s than there is now. If you do, even even counting um, Jan uh, that attempt to to overthrow the uh, the vote on January 6th, I mean, we had we had anti-war protesters blowing up buildings and killing people. Um, so. You know, it can it can get bad and um, and people can you get you get over it. You can get over it. It can get less bad and people go, OK, that was that it wasn't the way to go. Uh, let's try it a different way. And so it's, you know, it's like the stock market. It's up and down. Yeah, hey, that, it's a metaphor for life, isn't it, John? You know, that that stock market and marriage. Well, you know, good years and bad years. It That's just it. Happened. Yeah. Yep. That's the way it goes. What age you now, John? Do you mind me asking? 76. Do you see, like, do you still feel the fire in the belly for the writing? Do you still see yourself? Because, you know, the way some writers, they think, you know, they, they just kind of gave it up. They want it. But do you still feel that kind of desire to keep going, keep writing, keep doing what you're doing? I do. I do. Um, the, the thing I notice about being in my mid 70s is, um, you know, I don't have the, the, kind of raw physicality I once had for for fishing so I mean I you know I can't walk as far I can't climb as high I can't wade as deep as I once could um what geez I live in I live in the last county I don't know what you know about the ge uh, the geography of the west but I live in the last county in northern Colorado before you get to Wyoming um, it's the, and I'm a, a couple of counties over from where, uh, there are still wolves living in Colorado. So, I mean, there's a lot of wild ass country and, um, there's a lot of good places to fish. And if I can't make the, the 10 mile hikes anymore, I can hike a, a few miles and get into some really nice stuff. As for the writing, I mean, it's just the writing is really more what it's about for me. Um, I just, I, I will never feel like I ever got as good as I could get, but I'm trying. Um, that's why I read so much. I'm just always going, well, how does Margaret Atwood do it? How does Tim Englander do it? Uh, how's John McPhee do it? John McPhee's great. Cause he'll tell you, he'll sit there and tell you how he does it. <laughs> It's almost like a magic trick. Like I, you can tell me how you make the card disappear, but I can't do it. For me, it's that intangible. It's the voice. Mm -hmm. I think um, it's, you can have somebody write about the same thing, not using the same words, but you know, the same passage, but there's something uh -huh. about that voice. And, and I, I, I equate it to also, it's a bit like if you're a sports person, you could be talented, but if you're playing the wrong sport, you won't, you won't be as good. And likewise, if you're a writer, if you're writing in the right place, mm -hmm. the right style and the right, subject matter it, you just hit that sweet spot and then 
like you said, it's, you know, like McVie or whatever, like, or you know, John, obviously like yourself, you know, we ever yeah. tempted actually, sorry, I won't, won't keep you too much longer. We ever tempted to write other stuff yeah. outside of fly fishing. Like. I wanted to ask you that. I, yeah. I, I do write other stuff outside of fly fishing. Um, <laughs> the lady I live with, Susan, uh, runs a, a newspaper, a small newspaper here, a cir- circulation of about 3,500. And um, she was a career journalist. We met, in fact, we met when I was a columnist at, the, at a daily newspaper and she was the business editor and we started flirting and uh, the rest is history. But actually we outlived the newspaper. <laughs> uh, but um, she, so she has this paper and I write a, a column, a monthly column. And um she asked me if I'd do it, and I said, okay, but it's it's going to be anything but fishing. I'm not going to write about fishing because you're not paying me. And I, I get paid to write about fishing, and I have to make some money because you're running a stinking newspaper. One of us has to make some money. So I write about anything. I just Last month, I wrote about quitting drinking uh, like 35 years ago, What why, why I did it, what it was like. Um, how that, you know, I, I've had my first blackout and it scared the hell out of me. And, um, I've written about quite a bit about politics, uh, just this and that, whatever, whatever strikes me. I have, I mean, I, I, I sleep with my editor, so I have carte blanche. <laughs> <laughs> Don't change that comma. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never know. They might start collecting those columns, John, into a book. You know, I thought about it. In fact, I had, uh, I've had a couple of people suggest it, but um, I haven't had the time. You know, it's I've been doing it now for, for going on thirty years, monthly. I, I don't know how many columns that is, but it, it, an awful lot of it is, it's so local, or it's so timely that it's expired. Like I, I remember writing about uh, Bill Clinton pardoning somebody when he left office, and I mean, who, you know, people don't even remember who Bill Clinton is, let alone. <laughs> so it's like a lot of it just it's it, the, the statute of limitations has run out on it. It's just nobody cares anymore. But there's some things like there, there's some more general things that might work. I thought about it. I just need the time to sit down and go through. Wow, eight eight hundred and some columns, and see what's there. Well, John, um, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Before we let you go, we ask our guests the final question. You have been forewarned. Mm-hmm. Um, what was your most memorable fish on the fly, John? I think it was a nine-pound brook trout that I caught in Labrador, and I was by myself, and no witnesses, no camera. <laughs> and I know I know it was a nine pound brook trout because on previous trips, I had caught one myself, nine pounder. I'd seen two others caught. So I know what they look like. And there's a thing they do between eight and nine pounds where they get like a side of bacon. They don't get any longer. Yeah. But they get real deep. They look like a giant radioactive bluegill or something it, they they just they get really bizarre looking and i caught this thing and i thought well there you go and i hiked down and met my friends down at the boat and i thought they're not going to ever believe me so when they said well how'd you do i said well i got a pretty nice one and he said, how, how nice was it? I said, well, I don't know. You know, I didn't have a scale. But it was pretty damn nice. And I was fishing at the time. I was fishing an old Leonard bamboo rod. And Jim Babb, who, who at the time was the editor of uh, Gray Sporting Journal, he said, well, you know, your, your rod is bent like an apostrophe. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, it's a pretty nice trout, guys. And I made them pry it out of me. <laughs> and finally, they, they forced me to guess. And I said, well, I, it's, 
eight, eight and a half, maybe nine. And they went, wow, man. But I know if I just walked down there and said, I just caught a nine pound trout, they just said, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't the fish that was memorable. It was my, my diplomatic skills, I guess. No, no, I think it was your storytelling. It yes, was telling I just gotta say it. It's, it's always there, John. John, one thing: did you what did you catch him on? I was, you said, I was going to ask you. I presumed you caught him on a bamboo rod because I know of your that you you love bamboo rod. So you bent your bamboo rod on him. But were you on what? What were you fishing? Were you on nymphs, dries, or what? I uh, I was a streamer. Yeah. And it was it was a, a rabbit fur Matuka streamer, and I want to say it was gray. I want to say it was gray, probably with a probably with a grayish body. Well, uh, come here. This is probably the first bit of technical we've got at the end. Yeah, Yo, wow, th this is great. Um, do you use uh, bamboo for streamers? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I, this, see, we don't use we don't use bamboos much here. So my view is, oh, the bamboos. When you're fishing a bamboo, you're you know, it's either delicate nymphing or upstream dry fly fishing. But you actually use the meteor, and is it a meteor bamboo rod? Like, is it a heavier one or? Well, it was a six seven weight. Right. It was, a, it was an old Leonard tournament, um, and it's a it, yeah, it was an eight foot, a very fairly beefy six seven weight. I think I was fishing a weight forward seven line. Right. Oh wow. They're just they're they're big they're big fish up there. You need a yeah. you need a rod with some backbone. And I just I I don't know. I just have a thing for bamboo. I like to you fish. Do, it. Yeah, yeah, I know that. Were you able to bend that? Were you able to straighten that rod? I wasn't, but um, and you know, for the longest time, like for years, I left it bent. <laughs> <laughs> it has rod. It, it has it has two tips, and I would just fish the other tip and i left that as you know it's kind of a monument to that fish um i could have mounted the tip the bent tip but uh i finally took it to a bamboo rod maker a friend of mine who straightened it with heat but i, I that's beyond me i'm not going to be putting putting uh you know a mineral lamp to a uh, to a valuable bamboo rod well it was some fish anyway God, wow some fish you caught yeah. john garrick Thank you so much for joining us. Um, the new book is All the Time in the World. It's out now. Um, promise to me this. I'm going to try and get a junket together for you so you can actually come over to Ireland and fish it, right? We'll organize yeah. the junk. <laughs> okay. we get you on Loch Carob with Tom. And you can catch some of the, fun. You can catch yep. some of the best wild brown trout there is. Indigenous. Indigenous. Yeah, I get <laughs> exactly. it. Um, John, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Um, thank you so yeah, much for your. Fun. But thank you so much for your writing. It's inspired me. It's inspired Tom. It's inspired yeah. thousands and thousands of anglers and people who are into fly fishing around the world. Please keep it up. Uh, legendary. Can we call you legendary at this stage, or? Yeah, if you want. Yeah. Okay. Well, well the legendary. We call you worse. <laughs> <laughs> The legendary John Garrick, thank you very much for joining us. John, it's been absolutely great having you on. I'd just like to say as well, I mean, I quote you so many times on lots of things, so it's actually been great talking to you face to face. Fantastic. Thanks, Thank John. you. It's been fun. Our thanks to John Garrick for joining us on the show. I hope you enjoyed that because we really did. John's latest book is out now on Kindle. That's all the time in the world, and it will be out in print at the end of April. Don't forget to rate, review and follow the Ireland on the Fly podcast on Apple, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. Plus, you can keep up to date on IrelandOnTheFly.com as well as on Instagram. And myself and Tom will be back with another episode about the people and places of fly fishing in Ireland.